So in this lecture, we will talk about uh, creep crack growth. So we have talked about, we have spoken about creep and how the material deforms when it has, when the deformation is time dependent. And when it is time dependent, we have discussed in detail what happens to a material which um, which does not have a flaw. So we have considered, in theory, flawless materials. But similar to what we did in elastic plastic cases, where we wanted to find out that what happens if you have a crack already in the system, how the material will behave. And for that, the whole uh, idea of testing compact tens and specimen or single edge notched bend specimen and other specimens which are uh, which are used for conventional crack testing in the field of fracture mechanics so we have we have gone through those we have talked about stress and density factor and j integral which we use in elastic plastic material so if if the material is very very uh, brittle so the plastic part is very little then we can use stress intensity factor formulation and the approach for testing the material's performance or how much how tough is the material and if the material is plastic then the stress intensity factor formulation either requires you to test a very very thick specimen a specimen which can be uh, on a smaller scale can be as thick as two feet on a larger scale it can be uh, it can be nine feet to 10 feet thick. And doing those kind of tests not only requires a lot of material, but it also requires a lot of manpower and machines of giant machines, which can do those kind of testing. So it's an un unnecessary waste of time, energy, as well as technology. So that's why we have a better approach, which is J integral approach. So we will see what happens uh, when the material, so only difference is going to be that the material is going to deform in, uh, in and unlike creep, it is going to deform plastically. So as we have discussed, this is a compact tension specimen. So you see there are, so this part, uh, this part is a clevis, which is holding the specimen. So this is the specimen and you have two pins which are connected so there there are two holes in the specimen through which these pins are passing through and this part is called the clevis which is attached to the machine on the lower side as well as on the upper side this what you see is called the clip-on gauge or cod gauge so clip-on displacement or crack opening displacement so it measures how much crack will be opening and there is a correlation because this gauge is uh, is attached at the surface however the crack is far ahead of that place so there is a correlation and assumption which is uh, not uh, very wrong that these areas will be deforming elastically and crack tip will be obviously deforming plastically if we are talking about elastic plastic material so there has to be a correlation which relates that how much this tip will open up and that can be calculated from this why do we do this because as i said when these two pins will be going up there is a rotation involved and therefore the displacement of these pins which usually machine measures uh, will not be the correct displacement which will be happening at the crack tip. So you need uh, these kind of devices to find out what happens at the crack tip. So if I run this video, you see this is cyclically loaded. So, and now you see there is a crack. The crack has opened up to here and you see these are plastic zones. So that dip is because of the plane stress condition at the surface and that material is sinking in and you see that the crack is opening after heavy deformation there. 
So from this point beyond, it is not opening much. But the, the opening will be more inside in comparison to, to outside. You see, this area is completely deformed. So, so this is this was loaded cyclically. So this was a fatigue test, which is happening at room temperature. But you can do the same thing at high temperature. So you can either apply cyclic loading at high temperature, or you can have just monotonic loading. So just pulling up uh, at at high temperature. So in order to do that, you will have to have a furnace around this specimen. And once you have it, you cannot see the specimen. So from the outside, you will only have furnace, which will be creating a high temperature. So if you are loading monotonically inside the furnace at high temperature, then that test will be creep test, creep crack growth test. And if you are loading cyclically at high temperature, then that will be called creep fatigue crack growth test. So that's the combination of creep deformation plus fatigue deformation. And you have a crack also in the system. So this is for your visualization that what happens and what is so the mechanism we have discussed and there is another video which uh, will explain a few things about how material deforms and this is true what you will see here when there is a plastic deformation as well as when there is creep deformation. So creep deformation is basically happening at high temperature and it's a time dependent deformation and plastic deformation is not time dependent, but the damage in the material is going to be the same. So they are going to follow the same behavior as long as the material is either plastic or it is deforming uh, under creep at high temperature. So if it is a metallic material, you will have some void created in the specimen. That part we have discussed. So you are applying stresses on the other end and then these voids will join together and then they will fracture. So the same thing you will see uh, in the real experiment in this video, which happens after some time. So as we have discussed before that, because you have these voids and they break up on the surface, you see this uh, dimples and also you these uh, extended parts will look like fiber. So this area, if you look from top, will look like rough surface. So you will not see this kind of surface in fatigue fracture. So fatigue fracture is, is usually a flat fracture. Okay, so this you will see either in ductile fracture or you will see in creep fracture. This kind of uh, this kind of microstructure. So the fracture surface structure, which is called fractograph. So so let us see how it happens when there is a real test specimen. It looks like it's copper specimen. And you see it is getting, getting extended. So this is a tensile test. And here there is a little bit of necking already has started. And I can see some surface cracks here already. So that means the material has deformed and suddenly it breaks. So this is ductile because you have a okay amount of necking but it is not, it is comparatively not ductile. So it suddenly broke. And so you will see in the structure, you will see these temples. So these are the fibers which we were talking about. So in this video, what they explain is a very nice idea in, uh, in computation. So numerical simulation, how can you find out what is happening in the material in reality by uh, doing some mathematics behind it? The idea is very simple. What this guy is proposing that instead of taking all these voids in one go, you can take a small piece of the material where you assume that there is only one void. And then you find out the property. So you take a small volume. So you will have a lot of voids in this, in this area once the damage has started. 
right? And it will, so this is the surface of the specimen, which looks, once you have a lot of cracks on it, it looks like that. So what this guy has done or proposing is that you take a small piece of this part. This already is a small piece of the whole specimen. From this part, again, you take a small piece where you only assume that there is only one void in the system and then you apply load on it. You can apply different types of load, compression, tension, shear, and you find out that how this thing will be deforming if there is a void inside the material. Using this idea, you accumulate this. So you create more and more cubes which have more and more void. So then you are somehow generating the real microstructure of the material. And then you can use those mathematics, what you have got from one small unit cell kind of thing. It's not the real unit cell. And you can simulate that tensile test specimen by doing by applying that same mathematics of that small uh, cuboid in the simulation. And you periodically arrange those uh, cuboids and see in the simulation also, you can see similar structure, what you will get experimentally. So this was a very nice idea to, uh, and people use this kind of behavior, this kind of uh, mathematics, computational mathematics to understand the materials behavior, because it gives us an, us an advantage that using this equation, you can predict a lot of things. And if you are right, then you don't really need uh, enough amount of material to find. So for example, if you know what happens uh, in this tensile specimen by knowing the mathematics of that small cuboid which represents the material, then you can apply it for, for a component also. Okay, So you don't have to test a pipe then or you don't have to test, uh, let's say, a turbine blade. What you can do is you can do a simple experiment of tensile testing. You can simulate that by using numerical method calibrate it, and then you can model a uh, turbine blade or aircraft wings and uh, many other components, and you can simulate it using computers without doing the real test of the components, which are very costly also, and for those kind of things, you need a special kind of machines. So that's the advantage. Coming back to the creep, what we have learned is that strain is time dependent. We have applied a constant stress. And what happens is that this strain increases with time and it follows different rate of change in strain, which is described by the slope. So the steady state part, which is the second stage of creep, where the creep, uh, where the strain versus time relation is usually linear, okay? So we are not talking about primary creep. We are not talking about tertiary creep. We are focused on steady state creep where the strain rate is minimum and it follows a linear relationship. So there usually it follows a power law and it can be stress dependent. So if it is stress dependent, it follows this kind of equation, the strain rate. So strain rate is equal to some constant into stress to the power creep exponent. And this kind of law is called Norton's law. So, so this describes the creep behavior. But once you have a crack in the system, then as we have seen that you will have elastic, uh, sorry, plastic zone in elastic plastic deformation. Similarly, in creep deformation, you will have a creep zone. OK. and as we have seen that the strain responds with time, changes with the stress. So the point is that, see, for example, this is the response of strain versus time at certain amount of stress. Let's say that amount of stress is 100 megapascal at some temperature. So if you increase the stress from 100 megapascal to 400 megapascal, this behavior will change. So the strain change with time will be very drastic because you have increased the stress. What can happen is 
the primary creep part will be very small. It can be suppressed. And so you will have only the steady state creep and then tertiary creep. If you increase the stress further, then you may skip the steady state part also and the material simply deforms in tertiary creeps, creep. So it depends upon how much amount of stress you have applied and what is the temperature. So if you increase the temperature again, the deformation will be very drastic. So we are talking about moderate temperatures. So we are not going at very high temperature because at those temperatures you have grain boundary sliding and usually you will have tertiary creep. So, and power law breaks down at high temperature. So we, let's talk about moderate amount of temperature where steady state creep we can observe. And if you increase the stress, as we discussed that primary creep might be suppressed or a steady state creep also can be suppressed. Now considering this uh, and keep this in mind that once we have a crack in the system and we have applied some stress on it, so the strain at the very tip is going to be much larger than the strain in the remote areas. This we have understood in our elastic plastic fracture mechanics theory lecture that the remote area deforms elastically and you have a plastic zone at the crack, right? Similarly in creep, you will have a creep zone. But the stresses, you see that the stress increases as, as you go close to the crack tip. So in this plot, which is plotted on the, on the right hand side, so here you have a crack tip at this point, okay? And the stresses, so this uh, x-axis here is the distance from the crack tip. So zero means you are exactly at the crack tip. And then as you go on the right hand side on this axis, you are going away from the crack tip. So if you go much further away, then the stresses are equal to what you have applied and obviously they are elastic. As you come closer to the crack tip, the stresses are increasing, all right? So as these stresses are increasing, you can imagine what will happen. If you increase the stress, you will suppress the primary creep. You might also suppress the steady state creep when you can directly jump into tertiary creep. So similar thing will happen here that, you know, if you are, let's say in this area, so you are further away from the crack tip. So in this area, you will have not very high stress, although sufficient amount of stress to start the crack. So this part can be primarily, so this part deformation can be in primary creep. Then as you come closer in this area, so in the second circle, you will have little higher stress and at that higher stress, the primary creep will be suppressed and the material will be deforming probably in a steady state. And then very close to the crack tip, material will be deforming in tertiary creep. So a lot of damage will be there and the material will be failing there soon enough if it reaches, if it crosses the material's resistance. Okay. So this is what will, this is what is similar to when you have a plastic zone at the, at the crack tip. But again, material is also plastic. So once we are deforming something at high temperature, we are not suppressing its plastic property. Okay. So along with time dependent deformation, you can have plastic deformation as well. In reality, things are not so discrete that you can differentiate between plastic deformation and creep deformation. Because in both cases, what is happening in reality is dislocations are moving. So material will not discriminate between plastic deformation and creep deformation. It's just that the total deformation, let's say the total strain amount is epsilon T. So that total strain will have some component which is time dependent and some component which is not time dependent. You can also break the total strain between elastic part and non-elastic part. And the non-elastic part will have again two components. One will be time dependent, another will be not time dependent. So the time dependent part will be creep, non-time dependent part will be plastic strain, okay? So you, 
will have plastic deformation, which is not time dependent. So let's call that plastic deformation, time dependent, which is creep deformation. So you can have both of these. Depending upon what temperature and what stress you are applying, you can have plastic zone bigger than creep zone, or you can have creep zone bigger than plastic zone. So you can have a small plastic zone, which is circumscribed by the creep zone, or you can have reverse of that. So if creep zone is very small in comparison to plastic zone, then you can apply elastic plastic fracture mechanics because you can ignore creep zone, okay? But if plastic zone is very small, then, and creep zone is, is much bigger than plastic zone, then you cannot ignore creep, but you can probably ignore plastic zone or you can apply plastic zone correction uh, so you can assume the crack to be virtually grown to the plastic zone radius and you can then count for the creep deformation. So then three conditions can happen once you have creep deformation. This can happen also in plastic deformation that at the crack tip you will have a very small area initially. So once you have started applying this force on it, with time, so what will happen initially? Let's go back to that strain equation. Once I apply some amount of stress, what happens initially is that some amount of strain is a response of Hooke's law, right? And then there can be some amount of uh, strain which is plastic. Due to plastic deformation, if the stress is higher than the yield strength, right? Now this, strain which is there which is instantaneous with time you will get more strain because of the time dependent deformation okay so this is small creep zone that means a very small area at the crack tip is deforming time dependently and you are not changing the force you are not doing anything you just have maintained at high temperature and what is happening is that this a zone where the material is deforming, which is dependent on time, that zone will be increasing. Okay, because with time, this deformation is coming into picture. So as you give more time, this zone will be getting larger and larger. Now, what is this triangle at the back side? This triangle is coming because you're trying to open up this uh, this material. So once you are trying to open up that material, the back side of it will, will come in compression. Okay. So how can I show it? So let me take a paper. So if you look at this, so if you look at this paper and assume this to be, so I create a crack here, right? And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull this thing like this, right? And why it is buckling? Because the thickness of this paper is very small. So it is so small that it is deforming in plane stress, okay? So in plane stress, when you have a crack, the problem in, in testing these kind of materials in plane stress is that the alignment changes. And if the alignment changes, they will go in shear. They will go in mode one, sorry, mode two, okay? So it is very important to create alignment. So therefore, sometimes what people do is they put two planks around the specimen so that this specimen is not going like this. So if I'm trying to open up like this, what will be happening is that the back side will be getting compressed, right? So there will be a compression on the back side in order to open. So this point, crack tip, works like a hinge. I'm opening this and the back side is getting closed. And that is what you see in that picture 
is that you have a backside plastic deformation. It, it can be a plastic deformation if you're talking about elastic plastic material. It can also be creep deformation, but in compression, okay? Because backside is getting compressed. And compression will not cause a crack to propagate from the backside. Usually, it takes a lot of time for the compression to create a crack. And therefore, this part which is deforming is going to be static. It is not going to grow with time because the crack, there is nothing, no defect which is moving, unlike this crack, which will be propagating once you have enough amount of deformation, right? So this kind of deformation will have stresses which you cannot differentiate, but strain you will have to differentiate because these strains will be in compression and these strains will be, sorry, you cannot differentiate between strain, but you can differentiate between stresses. So stresses in the backside will be in compression and here the stresses will be in tension. So the creep zone has started growing both on the backside as well as on the crack tip. And after a sufficient amount of time, these two zones will join. So now what is happening is this whole ligament, which we call the, the area, which is uh, connected in the material. So, so this part is not connected and this remaining part is connected with the material and that part we call ligament. So the whole ligament is forming and that condition is called excessive creep condition. And once we have excessive creep condition, there are some formula which ap application of those formula becomes very easier to understand the cracks behavior in the material. Okay. So if you remember, we discussed about J integral in the, in the elastic plastic deformation when once we have a crack. So what was happening in J integral that we assumed that material is deforming non-linear elastically, which is also called deformation plasticity. So the name does not suggest anything about non-linear elasticity, but the assumption in deformation plasticity is that unloading or non-proportional loading is not allowed. So you are simply monotonically increasing the load. You are not allowed to decrease the load and that kind of plasticity is called deformation plasticity you can assume it to be exactly equal to non-linear elasticity, okay? Because we are not unloading. And under those assumptions, the strain is a function of stress to the power something. We have discussed this kind of equations. So sigma is equal to K into epsilon to the power N, right? And if you reverse that, if you switch that equation, you will get this. So what we have considered was sigma is equal to K into epsilon to the power N, so if you write epsilon, then it will be epsilon is equal to one by K into sigma to the power one by N. That one by N is N here and one by K is A here, okay? So we have this kind of relationship between stress and strain. So plastic strain and stress. There will be an elastic part, which will be following simply Hooke's relationship. So epsilon will be equal to sigma divided by Young's modulus. So we have that kind of relationship, then we can calculate J integral, we calculate J integral experimentally in a different way, but theoretically, it's an integration of the conservative field, which we have discussed earlier. So phi is the strain energy density, T is the traction vector, traction vector is simply the stress vector in inner product with the normal vector, stress tensor, sorry, inner product with the normal vector. So it becomes inner vector usually reduces the size of the tensor. So it becomes a vector from three to two. And so this is the traction vector use the displacement. So this is displacement gradient in X direction. And DS is the amount on the contour, which you are taking along, along that contour, you are calculating this property. This symbol with the contour gamma indicates that. So this equation, as we have discussed before, says that the amount of energy which is dissipated must be equal to the amount of energy which is supplied. So this is simply the conservation of energy formula. Strain, but, so here we are doing something which is per unit volume, 
per unit area per unit crack length so strain energy density is per unit volume and traction into displacement gradient into ds also gives you an energy value and then the remaining of that becomes j integral which is the singularity so this part we have discussed and there should not be any confusion in this the idea was given by rice james rice so that's how j comes now in creep power law creep we have a cousin of j integral so the problem you will realize is that this is not coming from any theoretical background okay so if there is any time dependence of j then that has that should have come in the form of differential of j with respect to time so it should have been dj by dt but you see that this is not equal to dj by dt because the second part will have a second uh, term where the traction derivation should also be there if you are trying to differentiate j integral with respect to time okay so this is not dj by dt don't get confused with that what is happening in a steady state condition is that the strain rate instead of strain strain rate is following a power law so we have a time dependence so we obviously cannot use j integral we so it was proposed by landes and begley and nick bin and webster and turner that and in those times there were a lot of proposals to uh, find out some integration with which is path independent like j integral because that will give you an advantage of finding something away from the crack tip so a lot of people were proposing a lot of things and c star integral was the final decision because this showed some good properties and also it was possible to uh, calculate it experimentally so if you see this equation the strain energy density has been replaced by the rate of change of strain energy density with respect to time here we calculate strain energy density by integrating the stress and strain so area under the curve of stress strain diagram if you remember that will be happening for each point in the in the material contour and in this case instead of having sigma into d epsilon we will have sigma into d epsilon dot okay so this is a strain energy rate density then traction is same dy is same as in j integral displacement has been changed by displacement rate so rate of change of displacement so this is u i dot is del u by del t and then you take a double so this is actually del u by del x del t okay so that part is different and then remaining terms are same so this is a cousin a look alike of j integral which works when the material deforms under time dependent so this we have not discussed in elastic plastic deformation also we will skip this part because this is a little complicated about it so so what happens is that the stress and strain at the crack tip uh, can be described by some equations which uses j integral okay and that is named hrr singularity because these equations were given by hutchinson rise and rosengren and this just describes a place uh, close to the crack tip where j integral is also not valid and that boundary is described by these equations which is called hrr singular so basically the idea is using j integral you can find out the stress and strain uh, close to the crack tip similarly you can using c star integral you can find out stress and strain rate uh close to the crack tip but this part is not important at this point of time so we will skip it and so this we have discussed now here we see that j integral is not calculated experimentally by doing that integration of um, phi dy minus traction vector into del u by del x ds we don't do that what we do is we load a specimen as you have seen in the video 
we find out the force versus displacement data for different crack growth and we find out the area under the curve of the force displacement which gives us the strain energy density somehow and that is related to j and final so after doing a lot of mathematics you will get this formula so basically uh, here uh, in the lecture we have discussed this to be del du by da which is where u was the potential energy and that potential energy we calculate by the area under the curve of the force displacement diagram so this is 1 by b del u by da du by da Similarly, in creep, we have C star integral we calculate experimentally by finding out du dot by dA. And the meaning of this is star here, uh, it is, um, how can I explain this? So, so let us use PowerPoint. So what happens is that this is my axis. And here, let's say I'm plotting for two different crack lengths. I'm plotting the force displacement diagram. So, which looks like this, okay? And so the area under this curve will be du by dA if I have two different crack lengths. So let me do it for a different crack length. We'll have a little different. So this part will be du by dA. Okay, and if I reverse this, if I reverse the axis, then that becomes du star by dA. So I will show you in one of the tutorials about this part. But at this point of time, these two are equal. So you can uh, you can just appreciate that in C star instead of having the potential change of potential per unit crack length, we take change of rate of potential per unit crack length because we have a time dependence also involved in it. So similar to the formula what we have discussed in J integral, we have formulas for calculating or finding out C star experimentally. Okay. So we will uh, stop the lecture here and then we will discuss further about the experimental calculation of uh, C star integral. And we will also see the effect of small creep zone and extensive creep zone on the C star integral, what we calculate, okay? So thank you.